Okay, so, uh, well, of course, welcome again to Principles of Counting One. I am your host, Dr. B. Happy to have you here in week one uh, as we explore accounting and business. So to access your content for week one, what you want to do is on the classroom homepage, go ahead and click on this module that says week one, accounting and business, and it has the dates for the first week. A couple of things to highlight here. Uh, Number one is this one that says week at a glance. When you open that up, it'll have a brief course overview of what it is that we're going to cover this week about the two chapters, chapters one and two. You will have the learning objectives that we're going to cover uh, during this week. And, of course, the wonderful lengthy to-do list. So you'll notice uh, the to-do list, yeah, yeah, it looks a little long. It, it's, it's actually a little shorter than this, honestly. But uh, it's chapters one and two, some cell worksheets that are for practice, a discussion forum, a LinkedIn learning uh, certificate, and then the two quizzes. So really, there's four things you have to do by the end of the week. Uh, for Sunday night, but this is just kind of shows you what you should be doing in each week. This week at a glance. Here in the instructional materials, this is where it gets important, yes? Okay, so the instructional materials. When you click on this instructional materials link, uh, the readings, it tells you what chapters you need to read by going back to your textbook. And also has, you'll have access to the PowerPoint presentations here. So the best thing to do is you can either open them and follow along here, or you can download them. Uh, You can, you know, when you download them, you can make notes, etc. So whatever works best for you. Uh, I strongly recommend you follow along with the PowerPoint presentations, yeah. Uh, there's some a little bit of reading here. It's just really just help. I just try to find what's helpful. Created this really fun. Um, it's called it's called uh, uh, like touch points, right? It's just kind of a fun little interactive element. And then uh, a little bit more reading, and then what videos need, you need to watch. It's designed the same way in each week, so take your time reading through all that. Next, you'll notice all of the LinkedIn learning videos. These are just videos. These are not uh, these are not related to the um, certificates. These are just the videos to help you to learn, reinforce what it is we're learning in each chapter for the week. When you come down to this folder that says Engage and Explore, this is where you'll find the Excel exercises. Remember, exercises are just practice. You'll also find, this right here is going to be your LinkedIn Learning mini course. When you open the mini course, it looks like this. It'll launch right here through Blackboard. Hopefully, it should. Uh, and then it starts with the videos. There's a lot of like short videos. And then sometimes there might be like a quiz or something at the end of each chapter. But you'll watch all these short videos, and then at the end, that's when you'll earn your certificate. There's also Excel exercise files here if you want to follow along with the videos. Yeah. So I strongly encourage you to do that. That's a wonderful way for you to learn. And then when you're done, it, uh, when you complete that course, it'll have you. Uh, it'll ask you if you want to download a PDF of the certificate. Select yes. It'll download to your computer, and then you'll upload that PDF right here, where it says LinkedIn Learning Course Excel Credentials. So it says upload your certificate of completion here. So you'll submit it here. My screen looks a little different than yours, probably, but this is where it'll go in. So that's how you'll do that. And then uh, I have the chapter, uh, two quiz, chapter two, discussion. Sorry, is it there? 
yeah, the chapter one quiz, chapter two quiz down here. So those are the four things you have to do this week. Excel training uh, for the certificate, LinkedIn certificate. Chapter two discussion board, where you'll respond to the questions and you'll uh, respond to two of your classmates. It doesn't have to be terribly long. And if you want to use like chat GPT to respond to that, that's fine. I, I have no problem with that. Just make sure that you include citations and references. And then uh, the chapter one quiz, chapter two quiz. Two attempts on each quiz. The quizzes are short. They're like 10 questions each. Yeah. Not too bad. But that's the, uh, the week in a nutshell. So let's start with chapter one. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about counting. The basics of accounting. Yeah. Okay, as always, if you have questions along the way, unmute your mic, ask your question, whatever you need, okay? Uh, I want to make this as interactive and easy for you as possible. Hopefully not terribly time-consuming, yeah? <laughs> okay. Uh, great. So here we go. Let's talk about uh, Chapter 1. What is accounting? Accounting is the language of business. That's the official definition of accounting, the language of business. And uh, Leland, I see your hand raised. Oh, I, it was about the uh, discussion. Oh, uh, sure. Just a brief question. I was going to ask, uh, you said uh, we can use, like, uh, like the information we get when we answer the questions. You want us to, uh, we can reference what we got the information from and stuff like that? Yes, please. Yep, okay. absolutely. It doesn't have to be APA format or anything like that. I just want to make sure that you give credit where it's due, where you where you learned it from. Absolutely. Okay, thank yeah. you. You're absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so back to chapter one. Uh, accounting is language of business. It is the information in business. Accounting is the records that communicates how the business is doing. That's really the basics of it. The way it works is we identify an economic event. An economic event is can be as simple as a transaction between two people. It is an economic event. You are buying goods and services from someone, a company. The exchange of the goods and services for cash, cash equivalents, it is a transaction. Okay, that transaction is recorded. We identify what it is. What was what was the transaction? Oh, Elon um, bought a pair of sneakers from Doctor B's. A fitness shop. Okay, so the exchange was Leland gave Dr. B's fitness shop $50 for the sneakers and Leland received the sneakers in exchange. Okay, so the, so the inflow to the business is the cash. The outflow to the business is the merchandise, the sneakers. That is a transaction. So we record that transaction form of what we call a journal entry. That journal entry gets recorded into what we call the general journal ledger. That journal entry at the end of each month is uh, we compound all of the journal entries that we've made for the month and we prepare financial statements, income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flows, Statement of retained earnings. We prepare those financial statements. We analyze information that goes into them. We interpret them and we make decisions. That is why accounting is important because accounting is all of those things. Who uses accounting? As I said, accounting is the language of business. Why? Who needs it? 
everyone needs it. Okay, you everyone is affected by accounting. We have internal users and external users that are all affected by accounting, and they need the information to make decisions. For our external users, these are individuals outside of the company. External. They're external to the company. These would include people like shareholders, people that own stock in the business, lenders, banks, external auditors. These are the big four account firms. They come in and they audit the books to make sure that they're true and accurate. Non-managerial employees of the business. If I'm working for a company, I want to know how well they're doing. You know what I mean? It's, it's important to me that I work for a company that does well. And regulators. These are lawmakers, the Internal Revenue Service, IRS, um, other government agencies, etc. They're all external to the business for the non-manager employees. They kind of work for the business, but they're not managers. The internal users, these are decision makers within the business. Examples of that would be purchasing managers, human resource managers. How about that? Yeah, they need to know accounting information. Definitely. Production managers, research and development managers, marketing managers, general managers, finance managers, everyone managers, internal to the business. They use the financial information found on the income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flow, statement of retained earnings to make decisions for the business. Absolutely. Counting is a huge field. Hey, there's a lot of roles, a lot of opportunities of working in accounting. <laughs> Some of it has to do with human resources, payroll, right? Uh, planning, general management. All of these individuals have to work with it, with accounting. Yep. So there are jobs that involve accounting. There are accounting jobs. This kind of shows you what those jobs look like. There's a lot of them. The world is evolving around us. Always and forever. And in today's society, 2023 especially, the use of artificial intelligence is upon us. You've seen in the news recently about things like ChatGPT, which is an artificial intelligence product that helps to generate artificial intelligence. Things like discussion board postings, for example, or it helps you to create uh, reports based off of information that you feed into it. Okay, that's just one of many examples of artificial intelligence. In accounting, we use artificial intelligence systems to help us to analyze reports and to generate graphics for those reports. Examples of uses of this are using something like Power BI or Excel to help us to Analyze and generate graphics based off of financial data. Okay, you wouldn't think that, oh, Dr. B, Excel, are you sure that's a part of artificial intelligence? Yes, it is. How do, how do you know that? Well, because artificial intelligence helps us humans to see deeper into the information. It helps us to visualize it. Artificial intelligence creates these things for us. It helps our day-to-day -day jobs. It's so important that all of you in this class 
have the opportunity to work with artificial intelligence in one way, shape, or form. You, and you do that all the time without even knowing it. That little thing in your pocket that calls people, it does more than that, doesn't it? It also helps you to browse the web. So what happens when you're, you're typing something into a search engine? Notice that little gray part? It, it knows what you're typing before you type it. It is artificial intelligence. The form of it. So think about these technologies in your careers and also for your personal lives because it's with us. It's, it's more so with us now more than ever. And as we move into the fourth industrial revolution, artificial intelligence is leading the way. It's important that you know these things. And how it impacts something as simple as accounting. Accounting, it's very important that we're ethical. In business, it's important that you're ethical. In your lives, it's important to be ethical. Ethics is critical to our daily lives. It's one of our daily values. Accounting especially. Why? Because we're dealing with money. <laughs> okay. I want to trust you with my money. You want to trust me with your money. We need to be ethical people. Very important to be ethical at accounting. Ethics involves transparency and trust and the belief that people do the right things. It's important that uh, we understand what ethics is, how will we use it in accounting, and how to identify potential ethical concerns. We recognize a concern, we need to consider the consequences and select the best choice of action to resolve any type of ethical decision, ethical issue. And how do we identify an ethical concern? Through a concept called the fraud triangle, which exists to better understand how to identify a potential fraudulent action. Fraud is the hmm, theft of something from the business. Okay, that's fraud. Or the intentional deception of a transaction or something like that, that is called fraud. It's important that we not only follow ethics, ethics but also follow the law in order to not commit fraud. <laughs> yeah. So, these three factors are why fraud happens. Yeah, there's an opportunity for it. The individuals committing fraud rationalize why they're doing it. It's usually because there's downward pressure on individuals to commit fraud. Yeah. So these three three things together are why fraud exists, and it's important to understand how to prevent it. Yeah. And in accounting, we look at ways to prevent fraud from happening. In the United States, we follow what's called the generally accepted accounting principles. And those accounting principles is what this course is really all about. I'm going to teach you the accounting principles and how use those principles to create things like transactions, income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flow, statement of retained earnings. Because everything we do in accounting is really based off of these principles, these building blocks, if you will. The, the principles help us to identify relevant information that affects decision makers, uh, and it also helps us to reflect the business activities in a meaningful way. 
who helps to govern the generally accepted accounting principles is known as the Financial Accounting Standards Board. This board was uh, authorized by the Securities Exchange Commission to essentially govern the generally accepted accounting principles that help to validate that everything being displayed from publicly traded companies is true and accurate. That's what they do. So they help to govern the generally accepted accounting principles. And that's here in the United States. Outside of the United States, the majority of countries utilize what we call the International Accounting Standards Board. And these help, uh, especially large conglomerate companies that operate both inside and outside of the United States, to adhere to the same standards across the board. Generally accepted accounting principles and the International Accounting Standards Boards are very similar in nature, but they do have a few minor differences. And they're working to reduce those differences and trying to merge to one unit. But I think that they're still a long ways off from that. I just want to let you know what it is. The framework behind accounting involves objectives, uh, qualitative characteristics, elements, and rec recognition and measurement. These are like kind of the building blocks, right? The objectives are to provide useful information to investors, creditors, and others. What is that useful information? That's the financial statements. Qualitative characteristics are the information that is both honest and transparent. Elements are the financial statements, income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flows, statement of retained earnings. Those are the four primary financial statements that we'll talk about all throughout this course. The recognition and measurement is our criteria that helps us to measure those financial statements. Here are the four principles of accounting. The principle of measurement, principle of full disclosure, the revenue recognition principle, and the expense recognition principle. These are the four primary principles of accounting. We're going to dive very deep into those principles here shortly. The assumptions that help to govern those principles are called, the, and there's four of them, the going concern, which represents if a business can continue into the future. Monetary unit, American dollar, British pound, the euro, the peso, etc. There's a couple of other currencies out there. That's the what we call the monetary unit, the type of money. You know, how's it measured? Is it a British pound, American dollar, Canadian dollar, uh, peso, um, euro, etc. It's monetary unit. The time period we measure four time periods in accounting. A month. A day, a month, a quarter, half a year, and a full year. A day, a month, a quarter, which is three months, half a year, and a year. So those are the time periods we'll talk about. And the business entity, what kind of business is it? Is it a sole proprietorship, partnership? C corporation, S corporation, those are called business entities. It's the formation of the business. And the constraint around all of these principles is called the cost benefit analysis. 
Whatever the cost is, it has there has to be a related benefit. That's what the constraint is. Okay. So let's dive deep into these four accounting principles. First is called the measurement principle. This is also known as the cost principle. This is where the accounting information is based on its actual cost. Actual cost is objective. Here's what I mean by this. The actual cost is not just the purchase price, what it costs you. That's not always just the cost. Here's what I mean by this. When a business goes to acquire a new piece of machinery, machinery has a cost to it. It's the purchase price plus delivery of the machinery plus the insurance of the delivery of the machinery plus the installation cost of the machinery. Those elements together with individual costs equal the actual cost of the machinery. I have a question. Yes, please. Um, with the cost principle, um, sometimes with, let's say, the machinery, there's also some training that needs to be um, mm -hmm. conducted. Is that cost for those trainings? Is, would that be considered as well? Uh, so I, I'm going to say it depends. <laughs> okay. And here's why I say that. It depends, Winona, because... Uh, if the training is a part of the setup of that machinery during the installation process, then that part of the training, yes, that would be part of the, uh, the actual cost. The rest of that training, if it just, hey, I'm going to show you how to use this machine type of thing well after it's been installed, then that would just be an expense. That's a great question. So Understood. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, great question. Absolutely. So that's the cost principle in a, in a, a very general sense. We'll talk more about that as time goes on. The next one I want to talk about uh, is going to be the, let's say, revenue recognition principle. In business, you'll notice uh, we <clears throat> to make money. Yeah, very obvious. Yeah, we got to make money. Yeah, so that's why we're in business. You don't go into business to not make money. Even a nonprofit needs to make money. That's how they survive. Okay, so. The revenue recognition principle tells us that we need to recognize revenue. I'm sorry, I didn't know the slide looked like this, but it says recognize revenue when the goods or the services have been provided to the customer at the amount expected to be received by the customer. Here's what I mean by this. Let's say uh, uh, Amazon, okay? Everyone knows Amazon, hopefully. Amazon is an online retailer. They both sell their own products, and they also have a marketplace for individuals to sell products. So let's say you're my, let's say, uh, say Carol is my customer, and Carol is on Amazon. So Carol goes on Amazon to purchase uh, a pair of running shoes from Amazon. So Carol's on Amazon to purchase a pair of running shoes. I'm Amazon. Okay. So Carol makes the purchase from Amazon for the running shoes, we'll say for $50. Okay? So... 
according to the revenue recognition principle, Amazon cannot recognize the revenue as being earned until the goods are delivered to Carol. That's why you'll notice when you make a purchase on Amazon that your card is not charged until your item ships. Okay? That's because of the revenue recognition principle. I cannot declare that as revenue until I've sent the product to the customer. Okay. At that time, I can recognize it as being revenue. All right. Now, let's say uh, I'm a lawn care service business. I mow lawns. All right. And Lewis is, uh, uh, Darius is my customer. And Leland is my customer. I got Leland and I got Darius. They're my two customers. And I'm on their block. Okay, so I went door to door. I says, hey, listen, I'll, I'll mow your lawn um, twice a month for $100. Okay, $100 a month, I'll mow your lawn. So Darius is like, oh, Dr. B, such a nice guy. He's going to mow my lawn twice a month, 100 bucks. Yeah, it'll save me a couple hours. Absolutely, I'll do that deal. Leland's like, oh, that's a great idea. So, so they both sign up. Back to B's lawn service. And so uh, here's how it works. So I go to Darius and I go to Leland. I says, hey, uh, customers, I'll, I'll mow your lawn for a year, a year's worth of service. Twice a month I'll show up, I'll mow your lawn. $100 a month. So I say to my customers, the, the price, it's due up front. Meaning, at the first of every month, you're going to pay Dr. B $100. Okay, $100, Dr. B's lawn service, first of every month. I haven't mowed the lawn yet. Okay, so I can't recognize that as revenue. It's what we call unearned revenue. So when Darius and Leland pay Dr. B lawn service company, $100 the first of the month, called unearned revenue for Dr. B. It's actually a liability for Dr. B. Because if I don't mow the lawn, I've got to pay my customers back. All right? It becomes earned revenue when I mow the lawn. Okay? If I mow it twice, $50.00. And then $50. Or at the end of the month, I make an adjusting journal entry and I call it revenue. $100. Yeah. The point that I'm trying to make here is that we cannot recognize it as being revenue until I provided the service. Okay. Otherwise, it's called unearned revenue. Make sense? Right. Yes. Yes, it does. Cool. Very cool. Thank you. That leads me to the expense recognition principle. This is also known as the matching principle. The expense recognition principle tells us that the company records its expenses incurred to generate the revenue reported. This simply means the principle of matching revenue to its expenses. Here's what I mean by this. In order for Dr. B to mow the lawns, there's an expense that Dr. B incurs. I have a machine. I have employees. I have gasoline. I have rent. I have utilities. I have transportation. These are all expenses to the business. Right? So I cannot, in good faith, record those expenses 
in a different month than when the revenue was reported. So, if I'm mowing lawns in the month of August, I'm reporting revenue in the month of August for my those customers, those expenses need to be in the month of August. I can't put them in September. Okay? I need to match when the revenue was generated related to those expenses. Expenses are what is what the business incurs to generate a profit, to generate a revenue. See? Expenses include things like payroll, wages, yep. Rent, utilities, uh, name it. Uh, anything that costs the business money is an expense right? to keep us running our day-to-day -day operating expenses. Uh, materials. Uh, for the lawn care business, it's gasoline. It's maintenance. Uh, paying my employees. These are all expenses. So... I match those expenses with the revenue earned for that month. Uh, Leland, go ahead. Sir, I was just going to say, is this kind of like similar to like when business, when it's like revenue and then you minus expenses and that, that's profit? Yeah, revenue minus expenses is called net income, which is also yeah. eventually profit. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Thanks. Yeah, right. pretty, pretty good job. Absolutely. And this, uh, so that's expenses. The last one is actually called, and I'm sorry that the slide seems to be messed up, but the slide, it should be called the full disclosure principle. It's the last principle, the fourth one. It's called the full disclosure principle. And that is that the company reports all the detail from those transactions to its users to make decisions. In other words, full disclosure principle means that we report our income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flows, and statement of retained earnings to our decision makers. That includes internal and external stakeholders. Yeah. So that's full disclosure. Uh, okay, I got Michelle. Michelle, what's up? Is that essentially what the quarterly um, earnings reports are that the stock market is looking for all the time? Correct. That's correct, Michelle. Absolutely. So, so, um, so Michelle's referring to is called the 10Q reports. These 10Q reports are reported to the Securities Exchange Commission once per quarter, and it reports the financial disclosures of the business, the financial statements of the business that's publicly tra traded. So the investors have an opportunity to make decisions whether to make an investment decision in the business or not, right? Uh, so yes, to answer your question, Michelle, absolutely, that's part of it. Yeah, so the, the, the full disclosure principle tells us that we report our income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flows, statement of retained earnings uh, to both internal and external users. Yep, well done. The assumptions of accounting. The first one I mentioned is the going concern. This is the assumption that the business will continue to operate in the future. I'm always concerned if the business is going to survive, <laughs> especially as an investor. I don't invest in failing businesses. I'm not going to buy stock in Sears. I'm sorry. It's just not going to happen uh, because I'm afraid they're going to go out of business. So instead, I'll invest in stock of successful companies. And I'm sure it will not go out of business tomorrow or in the next few months anyway. So the going concern is the assumption that the business will continue to operate in the future. The monetary unit assumption is the type of money it's using. British pound, American dollar, Canadian dollar, the peso, the euro, etc. A lot more, right? The time period assumption is it a day, a month, a quarter, half a year, or a year? That's the time period when the matching principle goes into effect. Yeah. 
And the last one is business entity. What kind of what kind of business is it? Is it a sole proprietor, meaning one person running the business? Is it a partnership, two or more people? Is it a corporation, C corp, S corp? That's important to know what kind of business it is. Along those lines, what kind of business is it? Sole proprietor means it's one person. It's easy to set up. Uh, the taxation belongs to that individual person. Partnership, two or more people. From an accounting perspective, we identify the amount of ownership each partner has. The corporation usually involves shares of stock. A lot of people own the business. It's based off of the number of shares that the individuals own. Well, and, of course, my favorite one, the LLC, Limited Liability uh, Corporation. Actually, individuals from being taxed. So the business is kind of treated like its own person. Yeah. So familiarize yourselves with the different types of businesses that are out there. The constraints of accounting involve primarily the cost-benefit constraint. What this simply means is that the benefits should be greater than the cost. <laughs> right? Makes sense. The, the individual should benefit, and the benefit is greater than the cost. That's what we call the cost-benefit constraint. Materiality constraint uh, is the information disclosed reasonable that a person can make decisions based off the information. And conservation and industry practices uh, might also be be considered a constraint sometimes. And essentially what this means is, um, is the business acting in a way that is based off of industry standards? Are they acting as a conservator of the environment? That's what that last one is. So these last, th that last one is relatively new um, as a constraint in accounting. That's because there's a lot of talk right now around uh, the idea of environmental social governance uh, as being a part of accounting. We'll talk a little bit about that soon. Now, I'm going to talk about probably the most important part of today's lesson. And this... Part, I strongly encourage you to take note because this is probably like the most critical part of accounting. It is literally the foundation of everything that we do uh, because it is the equation. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, while we don't necessarily focus a whole lot on math, we do use equations. And um, it's a matter of just plugging and playing with numbers, right? Uh, I want really need you to understand this equation because it is the foundation of everything we do. So here we go. The accounting equation. Ta-da! <laughs> I'm going to break down each part for you and make it as understandable as humanly possible. Okay? So here we go. The accounting equation is Assets, what in essence is what the company owns, what belongs to us, the company. What belongs to us, it's what we own. Those are called assets. Assets equals liabilities. That's what the company owes to someone else. We owe things, liabilities. It's a liability if I owe you something, right? Liability. I'm liable for it. That's why we call it liability. Liabilities. Plus equity. Equity is what the owners own. Okay? It's the difference between assets and liabilities. I'm going to break it down. Assets. Assets is what the company owns or controls. 
This includes things like cash. Cash is an asset. The reason why cash is an asset is because I can use cash to invest in the business. Okay? I can purchase things like equipment, machinery, uh, a building, uh, a vehicle, um, inventory. These are all things I can purchase with cash. That's why cash is considered an asset. I can use that cash to expand the business. I can use that cash to operate the business. That's why cash is an asset account. Other asset accounts include things like accounts receivable. An account receivable is when a customer owes the business money from a purchase that was made but they have not yet paid. For example, let's say uh, let's say this. Let's say my lawn biz my lawn care business. Leland uh, and Darius are customers of mine. I said, hey, Leland, hey, Darius, here's the deal I'm going to make you. Uh, I will allow you to pay me at the end of the month, each month, okay? Instead of at the beginning. So here's what that does. I'm going to come to your house and mow your lawn twice each month, right? I mow it the second week and the fourth week the month. And then I say, hey Darius, hey Leland, uh, here's the bill. Pay me within 30 days. What that does for the business is it creates what we call an accounts receivable. I expect to receive cash from my customers in the future for pay for the services I've already rendered. I provided the service. I delivered the good. The customer hasn't paid me yet. Therefore, it is an account receivable. I expect to receive it in the future. That's where the name comes from. Accounts receivable. Make sense? The reason why that's an asset is because we expect that you will receive cash. Good? All right. Cool. Sometimes that one's complex, so that's why I want you to understand what account receivable is. Other examples of assets include things like inventory. Inventory, absolutely. Inventory is definitely an asset. Why? Because I can sell the merchandise that inventory customers, right? If I can generate cash by selling inventory, it is an asset. The inventory is an asset. It has value to the business. It can help to generate Revenue. If it helps the company to generate revenue, it's called an asset. Cash helps the business to generate revenue. It's receivable is revenue. Supplies, or also known as inventory, I can turn that into revenue by selling it. It helps me to generate revenue. Equipment is an asset because the equipment helps me to create the inventory that helps me to generate revenue. Right. So equipment is an asset account. Land, the physical land the building sits on is an asset. Right? Because that land 
helps the company to generate revenue. The building, the building is also an asset. It helps the company to generate revenue. You see? So if it helps the company to generate revenue, we call it an asset. Make sense? Good, right? All right. Cool. I just want to make sure. So what if you're renting the building? Well, no, no. Wonderful question. The rent is considered an expense. Rent itself is considered an expense. I'm going to, well, I'm going to preface that because Winona, there's, there's like a lot of things. There's two sides of that coin. Rent is considered an expense if it's paid on a monthly basis and that the business cannot perform what we call leasehold improvements. Rent is an expense if it's paid monthly. If the business as a lease, the lease itself can be treated as an asset if the business has the ability to improve the property under the lease to help the company to generate revenue. So it's a little complex. The short answer is it's an expense. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah, it gets sometimes sometimes things like that get a little complicated. Great question. Leland, please. Um, can you explain the liability part of it? Because when you think of assets, I don't think most people think of equity plus liability. So could you explain it to me? Yeah, my pleasure. So and that's exactly what we we're just about to jump into are the liabilities of the business. Liability is any time the business owes someone else cash. I owe someone else. Examples of liabilities. Accounts payable. Accounts payable is when the business has received a bill I have not yet paid. It. Example, I received my Pepco bill I've not yet paid it. It's not yet due. It's an account payable. I have to pay it in the future. It's a liability because I owe that money to someone else. I owe it to Pepco. So the account payable are bills that the company has and have not yet paid. An example would be a utility bill. Um, it would be like like those kinds of bills, you know, the monthly bills that we receive, but I've not yet paid. Other examples would be, let's say the company purchased inventory from a vendor. They purchase it on account, meaning uh, the vendor said, "Hey, Doctor B." You can pay me in 30 days. You know, here's your inventory. Pay me in 30 days from now. We call that on account. So it's an account payable for me, the business, because they sent me the inventory along with a bill that says, hey, pay this in 30 days. Therefore, it is an account payable. And there's a couple of other examples like that, but those are what accounts payables are. They're liabilities. Other liabilities include things like wages payable. Wages payable, my HR people, wages payable is when the employees worked for two weeks the business has not yet paid them, okay? Because we know that it takes some time. It's usually the following week. So you work the two weeks. At the end of the following week, 
we pay you for that two weeks. We call that accruals. Okay, you're accruing time. It's called a wage payable. It's a liability to the company. You work two weeks. I haven't paid you yet. I owe you those wages. Therefore, it's a liability to the company. So, account payable, wages payable, taxes payable. I sold the goods to my customers, but I haven't paid the sales tax yet. I do that at the end of the month. So, I owe the sales tax to the sales tax agencies. Okay? So, in the month that's so that's taxes payable. Another example of liabilities. So those are all what we call short-term liabilities. They're due within a year or less. Other liabilities, which are more long-term liabilities, would include things like notes payable. Notes payable is a long-term liability that we pay out over the longer than a year. An example of that would be a mortgage. A mortgage payable. That's a, that's a form of a notes payable. Or a bank loan. Bank loan is a liability. Long-term liability. A car loan. Long-term liability. A student loan. Long-term liability. See, these are all examples of liabilities. They're things that we owe to someone else. Right? Now, let me explain uh, the equity side, and then I'll show you how it's all connected. Okay? I taught you, told you about assets. I told you about liabilities. Now I'll tell you about equity. Equity is what the owners own. This is the difference between assets and liabilities. In other words, you can rewrite the accounting equation to be assets minus liabilities equals equity. The equity is the difference between the assets and the liabilities. As you may recall from a very early math course, maybe, Right, so the equal sign when you flip something over to the other side of the equal sign, you have to reverse the sign, right? So, the assets minus liabilities equals equity is the way we can rewrite the accounting equation. Equity is the difference between assets and liabilities within equity. We have a couple of things. Someone was detected at your driveway. We have uh, things like owner's equity. Owner's equity are the investments that the owners made into the business. For example, when you first start a business, it usually takes cash. It usually takes some type of capital. It might take machinery. It might take something else. Those are all forms of equity. It's what you're putting into the business to get the business up and running. Yes, Leland. Okay, I was just going to say so I can understand. So is the equities, you all you said the stuff you put into the business, but is that the stuff you actually own after you assets and then you subtract the liabilities? That's the stuff you actually, how much your company or is actually worth? Correct. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the best way to put it. Yes, I would put it just like that. So the equity that the owner's capital or uh, owner's equity is what the owners put into the business. Minus what the owners take out of the business. The owners like to pay themselves. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with paying yourself. You take money out of your business, we call that withdrawal. This is also the form of dividends. 
dividend is a type of withdrawal. So if your company, uh, if the company pays out dividends, based off of the shares of ownership of the stock that you have, it's a form of withdrawal. So the owner puts in minus what the owner puts out. That's part of it. Plus net income. Net income is derived from the income statement. It's the total revenue. And revenue, again, is what the company generates through sales. Minus all of the expenses. Revenue minus expenses equals net income. So total equity, the equation for equity, is owner investments minus owner withdrawals plus net income. It's like the expanded version of the accounting equation. Does that all make most a lot of sense to everyone, or is there any questions about this equation? Did you say the equation one more time? Because I was typing it. Sure. Yeah. No problem. Okay. So. Someone is detected at your driveway. So assets equals liabilities plus equity. The equity part is what the owners put into the business. Detected at your front door. I'm sorry. Let me get this thing to stop. What the owners put into the business minus what the owners take out of the business through withdrawals or, or dividend payments plus net income. Net income is derived from revenue minus expenses. Yes, thank you. Awesome. Very cool. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any other questions about the income? Uh, the I'm sorry, the accounting equation before we jump into some transactions. You're doing okay. I, I apologize. We didn't get a chance to take a break, um, which means we'll have to do chapter two Thursday. So let's keep, continue with chapter one. Let's talk about a. Uh, transactions. A transaction, as I mentioned earlier, is an exchange of goods and services for typically cash or accounts receivable or whatever. It's an exchange of goods and services. Okay, that's a transaction. There are a lot of different kinds of transactions. It's not as simple as just a customer came and they bought something. There's a lot of other kinds of transactions out there. And so we're going to walk through the different kinds of transactions. Here's the first transaction. I think we'll roll through about 10 of these. Here's the first one. The owner of a company invests $30,000 of cash into a new business. Business is a sole proprietorship. Here's the transaction. We debit cash to increase our cash. You're going to hear me use the words debits and credits. A debit is on the left side. A credit is on the right side. A debit represents... Increase to assets. A debit represents an increase to assets. A debit also indicates. I don't want to word this. I'm trying to think of a good way to, to say this. A debit also indicates an increase hmm, to uh, um, to expenses. A debit represents an increase to assets and an increase to expenses. 
a credit represents an increase to liabilities and to equity. Okay, I'll break. We'll break it down. We'll break it down. But I just want to get, have, have help you to understand. Um. Those two basic components of what a debit and a credit is. The first transaction. Owner, the owner invests thirty thousand dollars in cash into a new business. We debit cash to increase the cash, and we credit the owner's equity account in capital to increase the equity account. You'll notice that when we do that, next slide, we've increased our assets, we've increased our equity. So take a look at this. The accounting equation is assets equals liabilities plus equity. Our assets went up by 30000 and our equity went up by 30000 Nothing happened with liabilities because there's no liability in this equation, in this transaction. No liability here. The owner put cash in. We increased cash assets. We increased equity. The owner's own. So zero would be in liabilities. You see that the accounting equation is in balance. It is in perfect balance. 30,000 assets equals 30,000 liabilities. Liabilities would be zero, technically, in that, in that equation. So far? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Second transaction. <clears throat> company purchased supplies, also known as inventory, for $2,500 in cash. So we purchased inventory for $2,500 in cash. You already know that cash is an asset, and inventory is also an asset. Now I can hear you saying, oh, Dr. B, how is it that you're only ex affecting one side of the accounting equation? You'll notice that when we affect only one side of the accounting equation, as long as there's a decrease in one account and an increase in another account, and they happen to be both asset accounts, the accounting equation still balances out. I reduce cash, but I increase my inventory account or supplies. $2,500. You see, that the accounting equation still balances. Make sense? You could. Write. Yes. All right, cool. So, hold on. So, you said, uh, so even though you lowered your cash, you increase your supplies and all equals out to 30,000 still. Mm hmm Okay. All right. I see. Exactly. So that's the second uh, transaction. Third transaction. Similar. Very similar, similar transaction. We purchased equipment for $26,000. As you know, equipment is an asset. So is cash. The cash went down, the equipment went up. Once again, the accounting equation is still balanced. Cash went down, equipment went up. They're both asset accounts. I only affected the one side of the accounting equation. The accounting equation still balances out to $30,000. Okay, that's the third transaction. Similar to our inventory transaction. So does it remain in balance because we return it into revenue? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so, so Darius, gr uh, great observation. Um, so ultimately, I'm going to use that equipment to generate revenue, and I'm also going to use cash to generate revenue and supplies. 
Uh, so all of those being asset accounts, the, the account equation is assets equals liabilities plus equity. As long as that remains true, the accounting equation will always be in balance, no matter what transaction happens. But the short answer to your question is yes. Uh, we're going to use supplies, equipment, and cash to help us to generate revenue. A great point. Fourth transaction. We purchased more inventory from our suppliers for $7,100. But instead of using cash, we purchased it on account. On account. Or on credit. Whatever. Same thing. On account or on credit. What that means is I'm going to pay my vendor later. I purchased my inventory. I'm going to pay them later. So I purchased it through accounts payable. So here's how it works. I debit my inventory to increase my inventory as an account. I credit accounts payable. Accounts payable is a liability account. Increase that to increase my liabilities. Remember, I haven't paid them yet. So it's an increase to liability. So the accounting equation, my inventory went up by 7100 My accounts payable liability went up by 7100 Take a look at the totals, okay? Our balances. Our balances are we got fifteen hundred in cash, five thousand six hundred in inventory, twenty six thousand in equipment, total of thirty seven thousand one hundred dollars in total assets. On the other side of the accounting equation, I have seventy one hundred seventy one hundred dollars in accounts payable, and thirty thousand dollars in total equity, which is also thirty seven thousand one hundred. The accounting equation is always going to be in balance. It needs to be always balanced. Assets always equals liabilities plus equity, regardless of the type of transaction. You see? Leland, please. I'm just making a comment. So if something's in balance or something, that just means you just put the numbers in wrong or you made a mistake somewhere. That's correct. Yeah, so, so for whatever reason, your assets do not equal liabilities and equity, something went wrong. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Great point. Fifth transaction. Our company provided consulting services to a customer. We provided service to a customer. The customer gave us cash. For the service right away at the end of the visit. Okay. 4200 So they gave us a check for $4,200 right after the, the service was done. So we, a check, as, sh as you should know, a check is as good as cash is. Somebody gives you a paper check, that's cash. It's the same damn thing. It goes right in the same account, right? Cash. Uh, so, customer gives us a check. We put it into our bank account. That's called cash. So, we debit cash to increase our cash by 4200 bucks, And we credit revenue, which is an equity account, $4,200. So, coming to our balance. We increase cash by 4200 and we increase rev uh, equity by 4200 Assets equals liabilities plus equity. You see that our balances still balance. Assets, 41300 plus liabilities and equity, 41300 Yeah. Okay, we're getting there. We're getting there. Next transaction. 
We had to pay rent. Of course we did. And we had to pay our employees. You gotta pay your employees. So, there's, this is really two different transactions in one. That's okay. You can do that. As long as your debits equal your credits. Okay? So, here's what we did. In the, obviously, we wrote different checks because rent is different than paying your employees. Those are different things. So, we wrote different checks. We just wrote the transaction in one transaction. Make things easy. It's a two separate transactions, you know? So, here's what we did. We paid rent $1,000. We paid our employees 700 So, Debit a rent expense thousand dollars. We debit our rent expense thousand dollars. We debit our salaries expense seven hundred. Then we credit our cash one thousand seven hundred. You'll see that the debits equal credits. 1,000 debit rent, 700 debit salaries. That's 1,700. We credited $1,700 in cash. It's basically two transactions rolled into one. For the journal entry, to make it easy. Now, we come over to our... Uh, Running equation. Thousand dollars rent, seven hundred dollars salaries. Those were both expenses, day-to-day -day operating expenses. So we increase uh, decreased our equity. One thousand seven hundred. We also decreased our cash. One thousand seven hundred. Look at the accounting equation. It still balances. Yeah. It will always balance. Again, unless something went wrong. Eighth transaction. We provided additional consulting services to a customer. $1,600. We also are in the business of renting facilities and equipment to our customers. So we rented uh, some facilities to a customer for 300 So two different types of revenue here. We have consulting revenue and facilities revenue, also known as rental revenue. So here's the way it works. We Debit, yes, we debit our accounts receivable, which is an asset account. We debit that to increase accounts receivable. The $1,600 plus the $300, so $1,900. We debit accounts receivable. And we credit different types of revenue. Consulting revenue, we credit that $1,600. We credit rental revenue $300. Your debits equal your credits. $1,900 increase in receivables. And then we credited $1,600 and $300 respectively. The different types of revenue. And this is what it looks like on the accounting equation. We debit the account receivable, 1900 We credited two types of revenue, 1600 and 300 respectively. The accounting equation still balances out. We're at 41500 The next transaction. Uh, we received payment from our customer from earlier. In the last transaction we uh, that was on 
accounts receivable. Now they're paying us. Remember, with accounts receivable, it goes up and it goes down based off of when you receive payment from the customer. The account receivable is generated when you made the sale on account and the customer has not yet paid you. It goes down when the customer pays you for their account. You see? Okay, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to keep up. So you okay. put it in the assets before they pay you as like we're going to receive it. And actually when you receive it, you put it in the cash and you go back to zero on the the you know the uh, on, on the receivable, yeah. Okay. So that way everything balances out. Exactly. Okay. You got it right. Okay. Got it right, absolutely right. So earlier transaction, the customer owed us nineteen hundred dollars for the rent and for the consulting. So now here they are, 10 days later, they're paying us. So we're receiving the cash. We're going to reduce the account receivable. So we debit cash and we credit the account receivable for that customer. So, so as you said, Leland, we increase the cash, decrease the account receivable. It still balances out. We're only affecting the assets. We'll be finished here in uh, about two minutes, so just bear with me, y'all. Tenth transaction. We paid $900 as a partial payment for supplies that we purchased earlier on. Okay, We didn't pay the whole balance to our vendor. We gave them some cash. It's okay. That's normal. So I'll give you a little bit. Now I'll give you the rest later. A thing, you know. So we lower our cash because we're paying cash for uh, money that we owed someone else, which means we need to lower our accounts payable. You see, accounts receivable and accounts payable, what we call contra flow accounts. They go up and they go down depending on the activity, right? Accounts payable goes up, and I owe the money. It goes down when I pay the money. You see? It works the same way with receivables and payables. It goes up and goes down, depending on what's going on with the cash. Yeah? So we debit counts payable, to reduce the payable. We credit cash to reduce the cash. $900. We see the effect on the accounting equation. It still balances out. 40600 is the new balance. The 11th transaction, the owner took out $200 for personal use out of the business. Hey, that's fine. It's your business. Do what you want with your money. So we debit owner withdrawal and we credit cash, the $200. Cash went down, and equity went down. Yep. Here's a summary of all the transactions that we made, all the transactions. You can see that the accounting equation is always in balance. So something like this would be on like a Excel spreadsheet if you were at doing yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Business. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, you'd see something like this on an Excel spreadsheet or, uh, or, or you know, something like that. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So all these transactions that we just walked through, they help us to generate the financial statements. Revenue minus expenses equals net income. That is our income statement. The income statement describes the revenue that we've collected from our customers minus all of the expenses we paid out for the day-to-day -day operations of the business over a month time. So at the end of each month, we generate the, the final income statement. Revenue minus expenses 
gross net income for that month. Okay? And then eventually you'll do it for the whole year. This second financial statement is called the Statement of Owner's Equity. The Statement of Owner's Equity represents the cash that went into the business to start the business plus any other investments that the owners made plus the total net income from the income statement minus any withdrawals that the owner took out of the business equals the ending owner's equity. The balance sheet of the business represents all of the asset accounts and their balances, all of the liability accounts and their balances, and all of the equity accounts and their balances at any point in time. The balance sheet is representative of the accounting equation. The statement of cash flows, which is the fourth financial statement, represents the cash coming into and out of the business for operating activities, which is the day-to-day -day operations of the business, investing activities, which is the purchase or sale of property, plant, and equipment, and financing activities which is taking out loans, repaying loans, investments from, I'm sorry, financing from stock and bonds and things like that. Financing. That's on the saving of cash flows. And we'll talk, a, we'll talk more about these things as we go forward. But it's important that you understand the relationship between those, those financial statements. The net, net income from the income statement goes on to the statement of owner's equity. The statement is, uh, of owner's equity uh, balance goes on to the balance sheet on equity. And uh, the cash from the balance sheet is reflected on the statement of cash flows. That's how the financial statements are all tied together. And we'll talk a lot more about the financial statements uh, throughout the next few weeks. In accounting as a manager, it's important that we interpret the financial data that's in front of us. And the ways that we do that are through ratios. A ratio is basically just a real quick way for you to get a snapshot of the financial health of the business. And here's one of those ratios. It's called the return on assets. And it tells us how well we're utilizing the assets in the business to generate revenue. Okay, the return on assets is net income found on the income statement divided by average total assets. The average total assets is found by taking the beginning balance of total assets plus Ending balance of total assets divided by two helps you to find the average total assets. Thank you so much, uh, all of you. I appreciate all of you uh, for your time today as we talked about the foundations uh, of accounting and business. I'm trying to get off my screen. I, just to recap what's due uh, this week, f of course, first and foremost, make sure you go through the Start Here menu, activate your LinkedIn Learning account, make sure that you have access to the textbook. Those are the most important things to do right away. Once you've done those things, go into week one. Start with uh, the, the at a glance, read through that. Come down to the instructional materials, read through that. Feel free to review these videos. They just help to reinforce what we talked about today. Uh, and then I want you to begin by working on the... Try, just try that those Excel exercises for Chapter 1. Just click on that and they'll open up 
uh, right here. You can download them. I recommend that you download them so that way you can work with them in Excel. Uh, again, those are just for practice, right? Before class on Thursday, I really want you to try to start uh, working through the Excel training, uh, Excel training mini course in LinkedIn Learning. And then when you're done, upload your uh, certificate here. I also want you to try to do quiz one. If you could do those things by th class on Thursday, that'll help you to help separate all of the other work, right? You want to spread things out. Don't try to, don't wait till Sunday to do all this stuff. Because you will not like me on Sunday. I want you to like me on Sunday. So please don't wait till Sunday to do all this stuff for the week. Spread it out. Make your life easy. Okay. And right. otherwise, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Liam. I was going to say, before class, next class, you want us to try to do chapter one quiz and do the Excel training. Yes, please. That would be that would be great if you could do that. Got it. Thank you. Uh, because because that'll help you to break up the week. I, I don't want you to feel overwhelmed yeah. at the end of the week. I was thinking that. Okay, feel less overwhelmed. Got it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. It, 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 and again, if you ever need anything, you can email me, call me, set up office hours, whatever you need. I'm always here for you. I want you to know that I'll, I'll always be here for you. I'm here for you, for you to be successful. And with that, uh, thank you all so much for your time today. I really do appreciate it. I appreciate you all sticking through with me. Have a wonderful rest of your night. I look forward to seeing you again on Thursday. Thank you so much. Thank all right, you. Professor. See you Thursday. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good one. Take care. You thank too. you so much, Professor. Have a good one. Thank you. You too.